Hello, welcome. This is week eight. It's Monday, May 22nd, 2023. Um, I'm in a different city today. I'm out of town, so that's why the background is different. I'm also using a my MacBook Air. I don't have my microphone, so hopefully the the recording, my voice won't be too too low quality. Um, using a 2013 MacBook Air, so um, seems to be okay though. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. Um, so today's topic is pretentious and money when it comes to art. Slideshow. And yeah, this is an old computer, so things will be kind of slow, fortunately. All right, the pretentious money, of course. So we're going to start off by talking about abstract art. Um, so let's define what abstract art is, more or less. Okay, so abstraction, as you can see here, is a spectrum from left to right, left being naturalistic, on the right being non-representational. Okay, so, oops, oops, oops. All right, so, <clears throat> so the spectrum of abstraction. So on the left, we, what we have is naturalistic. And so this is a painting that's meant to reflect reality as we see it as humans and make it as realistic as possible. Okay. Um, why is that called abstraction? Well, let me get into this a little bit further. So again, naturalistic is trying to be as realistic as possible, whereas stylized are next on the list under the line. Um, this is a more stylized, meaning um, it has a more idiosyncratic sort of um, style to it. Basically, it's not representing reality exactly as we see it. We, we have the markings of basically one person's view of how they see things or of how they paint usually. So, you know, before humans figured out in art how to do perspective and shading and stuff, um, they were very stylized in the sense that they could only reproduce the world to a certain extent before they understood how to realistically render the world. So this is still pretty um, quote unquote realistic in a sense, um, but it's not as much as this naturalistic painting of cows. So in that sense, it's going further and further from reality. This next one is idealized. So yes, this looks like a perfectly, um, besides being made of bronze, it looks like a perfectly normal human figure. However, what idealized is, is not creating something exactly as someone sees it, but exactly how they want it to be, how to idealize it, make it the epitome or zenith of the certain type of thing. So it's basically an exaggeration of big fish story, essentially. So yes, we are getting further away from realism and more into abstraction. Okay, so next we have down here abstracted. Okay, so we can see this is a yellow cow or a yellow bovine. I should just say bovine. Um, bull, actually. I don't know, bovine. I'll stick with bovine. So we can, we understand that, well, bovines aren't really yellow. They're, this is also stylized. It's not idealized, but it's, it's created in a way that doesn't represent the real world, um, not by lack of skill or knowledge as this example in stylized might be, but because it's expressive or just a different view of the world um, or something of that sort. So in this sense, it's, it's getting further and further away from reality. 
um, just like the other ones. But this is in, like very intentionally not trying to represent reality in any sort of realistic way, right? Um, so right here, um, believe it or not, this is breaking down this painting um, by Franz Klein into this these forms. So you can see the big yellow uh, bovine, the green here, there's some black here, green up here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can see that, okay, if without the context, these are just colored squares, but when put in the context of this yellow steer, um, you can see that, oh, there is it is represented here. Um, however, it's, it's they're just squares. Okay, and that brings us, and that's obviously further from reality than even this abstracted painting. So the furthest from reality is non-representational paintings. Um, so this this painting and the hundreds of paintings by um, oh, I can't remember his name. Um, I always I always forget his name on this slide. But basically, he's not trying to represent the real world in any way, right? So he he's purposely making um, this canvas with these three blocks of paint: the outside, this top, and the bottom. Okay, so again, he's not trying to paint a sunset or anything. They're just blocks of color. Um, and this is called non-representational, meaning there's no real life reference or reference um, to the real world on this painting. Whereas this, going back to this one with the squares, um, even though it's very much abstract, it's still referencing a steer, right? Or bovine, I should say. So this bovine is broken down here. Again, this reference is something that exists in the real world, whereas this painting doesn't. Okay, so, so of course, so this is what's called non-representational. It doesn't represent anything in the real world. All of these do. Um, however, these are all abstractions. What do I mean by this? It means it's not, basically not reality. So um, every single painting that that's depicting something, even as realistic as this naturalistic painting, it's still not the real literal thing. So these aren't actual bovine here, right? They're paintings made with oil paints. Prop. I think it's oil paints. They're, so you can't touch them and they will move, right? That's not going to happen. So basically anything that is a painting, even a photograph, those are abstractions of reality because these are probably dead. This, I think this was done in the 17th century uh, in Europe somewhere. I don't know where. Um, Rosa Bonheur. I don't know how to pronounce her name properly, uh, but yeah, those don't exist. So it's a, it's an approximation of reality. It does, it's not real. It's just the most realistic way to represent the world. And notice how I said represent. Well, this doesn't represent anything right here. So everything in art is pretty much an abstraction. Um, why is photography an abstraction? If you take a picture and it shows everything perfectly, it's because you're cropping everything out of the frame. So you're only choosing a small bit of the frame. You're choosing to whether to change the filter or not, to, to crop that even further, rotate it, put on filters. Um, those, those aren't reality, right? Because you, have, you can have pictures of uh, relatives who passed away. They don't exist in the form they do now, right? So, so they are abstractions of the real world. They, they capture a moment of time. Okay. Um, in regards to abstraction and abstract work, most people refer to non-representational work, right? So 
if you weren't aware of representational, non-representational, and the degrees of abstraction, you might have thought about abstraction as in things that are just non-representational paintings. Okay, so so some some people love it. I'm one of them. Some people don't don't like it, right? Uh, so what does this mean? Why would people not like it? So the biggest thing is they want representational paintings. Uh, they value artwork like that looks like the world we live in. So some people think, even though Picasso has these weird cubist stuff, the stuff going on, they still like it because they can see women or bulls or whatever within these paintings, right? And when there's nothing there, they just think it's a bunch of scribbles. Um, next point, my, most of the thing is scribbles and nonsense randomly put on the canvas. Um, yeah, I mean, that's another thing that people might think of as well. It just seems random. Um, there's no form to it. There's, it's just further from reality, which is something that some people don't like, which is valid and fair. Um, they usually want something concrete to connect to, but there's no hook in abstraction. So yeah, sometimes you want, some people want to have um, clear ideas, clear images, clear objects um, represented within the painting. And sometimes within abstraction, there's nothing there to grab onto. And so they don't really understand what they want, what the value is, what they're looking for, what or how to enter the painting or how to engage with it. They might just think, it's just stuff on the canvas. I don't get it. You know, I trying to get it, but I just can't. And again, that's fine. And they don't want to spend time and effort into how it can make them feel. So yeah, so abstraction, it does require a little bit more work, um, un unless you're just enjoying it on a purely aesthetic level. Um, you kind of have to sort of use your imagination in a way to find what you like about it, um, what kind of story it might be telling, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's interesting in that way. Um, also, not really in this point, but some people might think of that as less skillful, um, which we'll talk about later. So why might someone look at, like them? Uh, so for me, honestly, it, they just look cool. I really, I really like abstraction for, I've always liked it. Um, I've never had the language for it, you know, in before now, you know, why do I like this kind of thing? You know, elements and principles, the way they're applied and used, it's, it can be very, very pleasing. You know, like the ocean, for example, people love looking at the ocean. There's no pictures in the ocean, but you still like looking at it. Um, because of how things move, how it looks, you know, um, sometimes it's just like, it just makes me feel a certain way. Okay. Another, another thing people like about it is it can be interpreted in many ways, just like staring at clouds and trying to see shapes in them. Like for this one on the right, you might think of it as a bundle of nerves, as a bunch of um, thread on like floating in space, as a sea creature as a space monster um, just it could bring you a lot of different places with your imagination on what it could be um, again principles and elements are represented well and the way it can make feel, someone feel that's impossible to describe which is pretty obvious but i think that's something that should be considered more often that you don't have to have a reason for everything um, it may it just I think that's a lot of it to me too is honestly I just I just really like abstraction and non-representational stuff for some reason it's just always appealed to me it just makes me feel so alive it makes me feel like sometimes calm sometimes energized it inspires me um, some of it I don't like um, some of it I do and sometimes again it, it just can't be described because there are emotions that live within you so what about stuff like this? That's kind of just the blue canvas, right? Um, it's kind of stupid. 
it's, I mean, some art, I should preface that. Some people might say, it's kind of stupid. It's just blue, Ooh, three different like shades of blue, maybe. It's just flat painting. It's one color, um, doesn't take imagination. And it's just nothing interesting, right? So yeah, I don't mind considering being called a pretentious hipster. That's fine, because I know where I stand with this. For me personally, um, I I have an art degree, right? A couple art degrees. So I sort of look more into art than most people might. And I understand that. And some people might not be interested in pursuing an art degree to learn about intricacies and subtleties of things. You know, sometimes, uh, that might be considered pretentious in a way uh, to look at these kinds of things, but um, think about it in terms of how uh, movie or cinephiles like will look deeply at themes and shots and and really consider how the subtleties and nuances of things that might pass over most people. Same thing with sports, like an, a non-sports watcher watching uh, American football game, for example, they might not understand things, right? But the more you get into it and the more you know about it, um, the more how the more pretentious things you can say about it, right? It depends on perspective. So sometimes being pretentious just means you're an expert on stuff. Um, and I don't really agree with using the word pretentious when as far as pretentious is concerned, um, I would say that's more just like actually being a jerk about it and talking down to people, right? But that's the last thing I want to do. Um, so um, I delivered that little speech a little early. Um, so basically what you want to know is what do you want from art? Remember that question that I've asked and I'll always ask, what do you want from art? So for me personally, I'm gonna talk about why I like this painting. So blue is my favorite color, basically all different kinds of shades of blue. It's my power color. I like, not today, but I like wearing blue a lot. Um, it's calming to the brain, you know, scientifically and um, physically, I, for, I don't know the word for that. So I'm also a very sensitive person. There are three shades of blue, technically but it has subtleties of the shading within it right so it's not just a dark shade of blue it has like this darker shade of blue that gets even darker to here and this is lighter but you can also see it's not perfectly um slightly slightly less dark blue um and this is like kind of looks shadowy kind of darker so one little yeah, when little changes occur, they kind of stand out. And again, that's because I'm a very sensitive person. Um, just in general, I know this changes pretty easily. And so these things kind of stand out to me. So um, yeah, the little details like the shadows, like, oh, are they ribbons? Is it like a highway, you know, with um, how this kind of goes out? This gives an illusion of depth, right? Um, so I look at all these little things and maybe try to make a little narrative of it. So I've done a lot of paintings and this is a lot more difficult than one would think it is. It's not just throwing blue in, then a slightly different blue, and then a slightly different blue. Um, it's really hard, even though it doesn't look particularly perfect, quote unquote perfect, um, it does take a lot of skill to get this looking as flat as it does. It's, it, yeah, it is really, really difficult to get flat, to get, make paint, paint go flat. You know, um, yeah, you could, you could do it with sanding, but you have to sand evenly. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it than one would assume. Um, and also, I, I just, I just like it. It feels good. It's calming, uh, makes me feel kind of not, how do I say? It? Yeah, just, I guess just relaxed is a good way. It just eases me, you know? So those are some reasons why I would, I could like this painting. 
Um, and Ed Reinhardt, the painter of this, uh, this is a one of the his many famous paintings that are kind of like that. Um, so the reason I'm talking about it is because it's known, and the reason it's known is because he had connections in the art world. Um, he knows he knew a lot of people in New York. He was in the the big abstract expressionist scene. Um, he studied painting, so he knew what he was doing, and he knew how to make this pretty. If he was less capable of painting, it would look rougher and probably less pleasing. And he probably had a good business sense, which is hard for some people, including myself. So I, there's a lot of videos for this class, and I'm, we're not going to watch them um, because of A, time, and B, uh, copyright. I think our, this, this video and anything from the art assignment is OK to watch, but the Adam Ruins Everything, which we'll talk about later, um, that gets copyright copyright striked or whatever the word is. So I'm going to just do a really brief summary of this kind of thing. So this talks further about abstraction. Um, basically, abstraction isn't just comes from paintings, from galleries, right? Abstraction has existed forever. You know, when like in pottery, there's lots of patterns that are abstract that don't represent anything, um, you know, baskets have designs in them that are abstract, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just design in general, um, like signs and such, there's a lot of abstraction there and non-representational stuff. Uh, sometimes abstract abstraction is just the best way to do things where representing the real world in some ways doesn't make sense. Um, sometimes you want to have express an emotion and maybe you you feel like an emotion is best represented as like red and blue waves alternating colors you know with this sort of intensity that you can't really show in a picture or if you did it might just be a, a portrait with someone's facial expression whereas you know it might be more interesting to do the blue and red waves because it's more ambiguous um, you know exactly what you meant. A viewer could have the same feelings from looking at it, or they might think something different. So sometimes you don't want to pin things down exactly. Maybe you want it, want an abstract painting or non-representational painting to sort of elicit different reactions or emotions. Um, so yeah, also, you know, painting became more abstract over time because um, but photography, again, I mentioned this before, but photography was representing the world really well. And so painting didn't ha feel have the burden of that anymore. So things just kind of like over time, over a period of artists, um, paintings became more abstract because, oh, this is possible. I don't have to do this. And this is an interesting new way of doing things like the yellow bovine. Right. Um, that might have by that might have not have happened 100 years ago, but it happened at that time because people were getting excited about these kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, just in case I didn't mention this, I want you to watch these videos. They're excellent and they're mentioned in the quiz. OK, so this is a video about these all white paintings um, that are in galleries and they sell for X amount of money. Uh, so these are, so what people are usually talking about are referring to these minimalist paintings that are a little movement in their own. Um, they they existed for several reasons. Um, I'm not gonna go into too many, but it was a reaction to the abstract, abstraction with crazy colors and lots of emotions put into it, right? Um, a lot of it was artists trying to remove authorship, meaning they wanted to make objects that looked like they were objects that they, um, how am I trying to say it, uh, just made objects to exist as more or less beautiful things, right? Um, whereas they didn't want to, they wanted to remove the ego from them as if the universe produced them. And sometimes 
um, bringing attention to th like materials like steel or canvas like just look how beautiful this very shiny steel cube is notice the reflectivity of it you know how does how does it look like when you're walking around it when you look at it up close right so it's there's a lot about the material of the thing and less about what it's trying to present or represent okay but that's a very limited view of these paintings that's just some examples that might make sense there's more that's explained here so with these paintings um i would say probably 99.9999 percent of the time um they're not literally just white paintings uh they there's a lot of subtleties in there for example there might be um slightly pink tones in there, slightly orange tones. There might be some texture that's kind of hard to see. It that might be very, 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 very soft colors that are hard to see over the internet through your screen. Um, and I would argue that many of these are probably meant to be seen in person and to be experienced in person, um, especially since like some of these paintings can be really large too. So it's a lot of it can be about you being present here because a lot of these were made in, you know, 60s and 70s where we didn't have the Internet back then. So people were expected to see them in person. Okay. And again, this video goes more into that. Um, and yeah, a part of this, too, is just it requires more work again, going to the to the phrase, what do you want from art? You know, so again, as me as an artist, as a art lover, I love really subtle things. I love when things have very small changes because it can be intense to me. But if someone's not really into that, if they want to see pictures, if they want to see um, bold shapes and bold colors, it's okay to reject this kind of thing because that's not really what you're looking for. If you love textures and how light bounces off it differently, um, then you might be more into this kind of thing. And neither approach is better than the other. And of course, there are shades of gray within that. So again, it goes back to, well, what do you want from art? And if you don't want minimalist paintings and you don't want to put work into that because it's just not really your thing, that's totally fine. Uh, so always make sure to sort of see like, do I hit it just because it's it looks lazy? Well, try to go beyond that. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing. Um, I guess I'll talk about that more. But yeah, it's they're not maybe they are lazy sometimes. I can't speak for everyone, but sometimes it is a lot of hard work to make some of these paintings. Um, and you'll see more of them within the video, and it really shows the differences between them that, again, might not be apparent to people who look for bright and bold things, um, but for people who want to look for subtleties, that makes sense, and that's fine, and that's great. Okay, and then this usually comes to this um, question of, or statement, I could do that. My five-year-old kid could do that, right? Um, so which is an interesting topic that this video goes over. Um, so most of the, t I would say a lot of the time when there's a painting that someone did that looks pretty easy to do, you'll say, I could do that. My five-year-old could do that. Um, chances are you probably couldn't. It probably takes a lot more skill than you would assume. Um, and that's not the way of poo-pooing on people who say that. I'm just saying in the fact that it, some of these things actually do take skill and take a lot of control in order to make them, but they're done in a way that seems effortless or seems simple or lazy, um, when that might not be the fact. That might happen sometimes, though. Sometimes things might be done pretty easily, right? But with that, that usually comes from a lot of skill. And within this video, you'll see examples of Matisse drawing something simple, uh, contour lines of a woman that looks easy to do. But even as someone who's been making art his whole life, I couldn't do anything that 
simple and elegant. Okay. Another point is you didn't do it. So you're not the one who created this work. You're not the one who had the business sense to network with people, to talk to um, galleries and curators and art historians to get that into a gallery and probably have an art education, right? So why isn't your painting that you just made in five minutes on the gallery wall? Well, you kind of need to do a lot of work networking, um, a lot, I would say mostly networking and to get into those kind of situations, right? Which takes a lot of work and effort. You know, curators aren't necessarily just gonna come to your house to look at stuff and say, oh, I wanna put this painting you did in five minutes on the wall. Um, a lot, uh, yeah, a lot of it is honestly, sadly, kind of networking, um, which is an interesting topic that I've, I guess, yeah, I, I guess I talked about last week where, you know, certain people are, excluded certain people are included um but yeah it's a very complicated system on how these weird or juvenile or childlike paintings get into galleries and sold for a lot of money um <clears throat> next point in context of how where it was ma made matters so remember that nothing's made within a vacuum sometimes the the painting that might look like this, like paint scribbles and slashes and stuff, looks kind of sloppy, but at the time it could have been really groundbreaking and help people understand, oh, I can have a looser, more gestural approach to painting, you know? And even if they like make figurative stuff, they could use some techniques like, oh, I'll use like this paint throwing technique to create clouds or shadows or trees. You know, so sometimes it, what it comes from is just, it was new, it was fresh, it was different. Um, it was rejecting old people's views of things, right? So yeah, the context always, always matters, right? Uh, I mean, there's plenty of things that are outdated today that we would think like, that's kind of stupid, you know, like, there's a lot of, like when I think of 90s commercials, 1990s commercials, I think of a lot of toys that don't really exist anymore. And that's because, well, like, God, I'm going to sound old. Like, you know, kids were more used to going outside and like doing hula hoops and uh, oppets or whatever. Um, that point's kind of muddled, but basically like, a lot of those things that exist now that existed back then don't really make sense in the context now so you got to think about what that's why it's important what year an artwork is and because it helps give you idea of what why it might be might have been made okay um, and also the good point that photography wasn't considered art or considered skillful when it started um, think about that um so yeah Art is pretentious. I love this video. So this is basically a, a reaction to comments saying that this is pretentious, that is pretentious, et cetera. Um, so, in the, so the first point, Sarah, of this video, the host of this video says that, yeah, artists are pretentious. Because, and you know, it's easy to agree to that because you kind of have to have an ego in order to make stuff and think it's good enough to show other people and possibly show in galleries. For example, uh, in order to get into grad school, I had to submit a portfolio of my artwork. Well, honestly, I had to think, yeah, my artwork's better than like these 200 other people that are applying to this position. And there's only 10 spots. Like if in a way, like, I'm just an artist. I don't, I honestly don't feel like I'm that great of an artist. I have like funny and silly ideas that I can execute, um, whatever, but I wouldn't consider myself a great artist by any means. But I had to have that perspective of, you know what, I really want to go to grad school so I can teach. Um, so I'm going to, make artwork and I'm gonna just like say like hey I think I'm better than these other people 
you know, otherwise you're just giving up, giving up and letting other people put their artwork in galleries or whatever. So in a way, yeah, artists have to be pretentious in order for their artwork to be seen. Um, pretentious meaning thinking they're greater than they really are. Um, and yeah, and art itself is pretentious in a way because you're taking these funny materials like pigment or whatever and spreading them in a certain way and then they become more valuable all of a sudden, right? Like if it was like, you know, people have seen monkeys and elephants make paintings, um, but like humans make paintings in a more deliberate way, that scene is more impressive. Um, and that's, and that's still the same material, even if like, it's just the same material, like a puppy putting their paw randomly on a canvas and a human painting a paw, you know, with lighting and depth and perspective and such. Like it's the same materials, but one is more quote unquote better than the other in an artistic sense. So that is also a way of seeing that art is pretentious. Okay. Um, and of course there's the context of like regular sunglasses versus if Elvis wore those sunglasses, they're more expensive and more important and people will like it more, right? Um, and throughout all of this basically is like, well, remember that you should keep an open mind about these things. Um, try not to crap too much on them. Think about why you dislike or like something. Remember lesson one. Um, and just, yeah, just think about things, be open-minded. Okay. So, um, yeah, a huge reason why this matters to people, why these weird abstract paintings or minimalist white paintings get people mad is because money and fame. So this is a really great video. Um, it's kind of all, all negative. There's positives about it, but it brings about a lot of good points. So yeah, so when it comes to gallery art world of, you know, expensive $10,000 paintings and such, um, a lot of it does tend to be kind of dark and scammy and not full of pure intentions. Surprise, surprise. So the art market generally does benefit wealthy collectors and exclude artists. So I forget which week I talked about it, but yeah, a lot of artists um, who've been making art for a while um, who aren't rich, they they can't afford their own works, right? So who are they making them for? They're making it for people who can afford them. So yeah, like uh, someone in school um, is probably not going to be able to afford to make, um, if they're like in a painting program and they make something gorgeous might sell for like 500 8000 whatever dollars but you're in school you can't afford that you know and so it these things are usually made for wealthy people um so the next point art is expensive because some people arbitrarily decided this that's true also like not not the case all the time but yeah, um, you'll see in this video how some like collectors and gallerists and museums will sort of inflate a price. Um, it depends on so many factors, like is this artist hot? Have they been selling well? Are they old? Um, are they, is like, for example, um, like is Chinese, are Chinese artists kind of trending right now? Are we focusing on China and it's being, a, you know, stuff like that. So that kind of stuff helps determine things. Um, art auctions are, are bad as well. You'll see the problems with those. I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, sometimes not everything is perfectly legal, such as money laundering that happens with art. Um, donations are tax write-off, so when people collect artworks and donate them to galleries or museums, it is a tax write-off. And basically, the artists who market best win this kind of game. 
So essentially what this video says is like art's not pure when it comes to the art market. Like you do have to network in order to get your name known. It doesn't matter how good you are. Um, that does help the better you are. But what really matters is your business sense and how you can connect to people and network with people. Um, that's one reason I don't really do this thing at all is because I don't want to put effort into that because um, I just want to do everything. Uh, I don't know how to network well. I just like people and hope um, they like me back, you know, but I don't I don't want to go to all these gallery shows when I'd rather be inside um, playing a game or listening to music. You know, I don't like schmoozing. I can't do it with a straight face. I can't do anything straight, you know, but it's it's a weird, weird world to exist in. And that's why I don't want to be a part of it. But kudos to those who do. OK, so so think about we're going back to abstraction because it's a popular thing to hate on. Um, think about, again, the context of where, where it exists. So when you see an abstract painting in a hotel, for example, um, it's probably a lot. People are probably going to be offended less. Because we well, you know you don't know how much it costs. It's decoration so it probably wouldn't cost that much um you've probably never seen it before so it doesn't have infamy or fame to go along with it so when you take away those factors like do you really hate it um are your feelings magnified are the fit or do your feelings like don't exist anymore like oh never mind um, it could change depending on how you see things um, but yeah think about when you think of expensive paintings in galleries, um, remember if it was five dollars, if your friend give gave it to you, um, if it was sitting in a warehouse randomly on the wall, how would that change how you think about it? And um, you should, I mean, you could do this with paintings you like too, but this is really effective for paintings you don't like. Remember, like you know, a big a good example is the band Tool. Um, I don't know their music, but I haven't really gotten into their music because uh, fans are known for being kind of weirdos in a not great, maybe even pretentious way, you know, so you know how fans can ruin things well. Take away the context of the fans and enjoy it on your own. That might change your perception about things. Okay, um, this is a really nice article about um, an artist doing kind of a prank of there he was given 85 sorry eighty four thousand dollars in cash um used blank canvases entitled take the money and run um, article so here's the link to it and this is the museum statement um, of course there's the banana um definitely watch this and learn the facts behind it of course, it's a few years old, but I'm sure most people remember this. So it, there's a lot more context behind this banana than just it was someone who just slapped it on an art wall on the wall at a art museum and it costs a lot of money now. Um, it, there's a lot of context behind this that I definitely recommend watching and learning about here. And I, again, I think it's on the quiz, a question regarding this. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's it's a really really cool video. Um, and then here's another fruit based artwork. Well, I should talk about this re just real quick. So basically, the uh, the artist Mauricio Catalan is kind of like a prankster or jokester in the art world. He's known to do like funny weird things, like a a sculpture of the Pope being hit by a meteorite, and there's controversy around this and um, because like, what is art now? It's just a banana and duct tape on the wall. It's a literally a hundred year old conversation. Um, as far as putting ob ordinary objects in um, a museum setting and calling it art, um, there's a lot of precedence behind that you'll, that you'll learn about with this video. Um, also, like I kind of see it as a way to, and it's said in this video that 
I always thought of it as like it's this prank on art collect on rich art collectors where this artist who is probably has a lot of money that's um very likely um where he's like purposely selling this kind of thing for a lot of money to sort of play a prank on these collectors who will collect anything as long as it really helps their um, reputation um because going back to the collectors thing some like sometimes collectors oh i did talk about this like collectors don't this always collect because they love it they collect it because it's impressive like oh you have a picasso even if it's a piece of crap painting um, sometimes it's just all about appearances so i think he was kind of making fun of that kind of world um here's a more i would definitely say more interesting artwork um, that was done from 92 to 97 Basically, it's I'm not going to go too far into it because I haven't I don't know a whole lot about it, but basically it's regarding the AIDS crisis um, in the 80s and dealing with how that affected people, um, especially people of color and uh, margin, other marginalized people. Um, and it's real rotting fruit, but it has banana or sorry, it has like zipper in it and other stuff. So um there's precedent for real art being used or real fruit or fruit and food being used as art. Um, it's interesting to read about. Here's the article. Um, and yeah, I re always remember that appreciating an artwork is not the same as liking it. So again, you can appreciate what the artist does, but not really like it. You know, I feel the same way about the Mona Lisa, like I appreciate what it's done to make people interested in art, but like when things are just shoved, like shown over and over and over, I'm just like, oh, enough already. I don't wanna look at this again and again and again. Um, that's just me with like really, really intensely prolific images. It's just like, I wanna see this new and fresh stuff. I don't wanna see the same thing over and over and over again. You know, I want to be surprised all the time. Um, but yeah, so, um, remember that it can always lead to a, the appreciate to liking something when you appreciate something, when you put effort into it. Um, you're not just looking at it and dismissing it. You're trying to understand why you don't like it, and in the process you might end up liking it, right? So I'm just gonna just read through the slides from week one real quick. Um, I had a new image of Masanao Hirayama. He does these really childlike images, which I, I think are just really, really funny. Um, remember, why do you like an artwork, right? Think about those types of things. We didn't, I didn't talk about the language of elements and principles in week one, so remember this again. Um, look at the details. Does it look pointless? Do you hate that cost so much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what about art that you do enjoy? Think about how it makes you feel, etc. Um, modern art, remember this. You should have watched this video with Marley Safer. Or sorry, this is Andy Rooney um, being a jerk. This is Marley Safer, which is 60 minutes. And actually, last night um, of all nights, there is a follow-up from last uh, the this video right here from 93 about art and he talked to Jeff Koons. Um, here's Anderson Cooper talking to Jeff Koons with a more open-minded view. And what I like about this video um, is the fact that he is more open-minded and he sort of lets the viewers decide what they want to think. Whereas the other two men, they were saying, this is kind of crap, the emperor's new clothes. Um, he allows dialogue with the viewer to happen. and. Which is which makes more sense in this web 2.0 world where we're used to commenting, where we're used to having the dialogue with these kinds of things, right? So instead of telling people what to think, Anderson Cooper, Cooper leaves these questions open, now, even though you can tell he doesn't like some of the stuff. Um, so this is just a preview of this. The actual thing's like 15 minutes, I think. So lessons to take from the videos. Again, making blanket statements is bad, like all abstraction is bad. You might find great abstraction. 
um, consider many works, not just extreme examples. So again, the things that make the news, like the banana, don't represent all of art. It represents one little piece of art, one little drop of in the bucket. Be open to new ideas. That makes sen sense, you know. You shouldn't just keep your old ways about you. You should always try to learn more, experience more. You can, that doesn't change you as a person. It just means you're, you're open to new ideas and you can still have the same core of yourself, which is how I am. I have very specific things I like and don't like, but when there's something that's out of my wheelhouse, you know, I try to expand myself to it. I'm trying to do that a little bit more with country and classical music, which is out of my wheelhouse. I didn't grow up with it. I don't know much about it, but I'm trying to consider it more and more. Um, again, these videos suck. Those two videos, not the Anderson Cooper one, suck because they're influential um, and they're telling people what to think and people will just follow them blindly because they're respected but not by me and always remember that sometimes you don't have to think about everything critically um, that's not realistic unfortunately so sometimes you can take a break and just don't like things but also there's my favorite thing to do is not complain about things on the internet um, my favorite thing is keeping complaints to yourself unless it does good for the world so I think I like to personally shut up a lot and just let things be unless something needs to be addressed for reasons that can be helped and are constructive. Um, so here's a quick preview for next week, which I'm talking about AI um, ties in with the abstract expressionism slash minimalism I talked about and AI imagery. So um, yeah, um, so that's about it for today. Um, oh, they actually went almost the entire, I was expecting it to be a shorter um, one, which I say every time. But yeah, um, thanks for watching this and hanging out. And I hope you enjoy the videos. Um, I'm going to post things now and see you on Discord. Bye bye.